All right, um, let's let's start. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Ablon, editor in chief of Pensions and Investments. Thank you all for joining us. We have Jeffrey Gunlock, one of the most influential investors in the world during a volatile and extraordinary week in financial markets triggered by the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. Jeffrey is the CEO of Double Line Capital and known on Wall Street as the Bond King. Thank you for being here with us, Jeffrey. Right. Nice to be here. We have a lot to cover in the next 45 minutes, so let's kick things off with the Federal Reserve. Uh, everything is pretty fluid in markets right now. And several days ago, before the CPI report, you said that you thought the Fed would raise interest rates by 25 basis points. We did get news this morning from the Wall Street Journal that J JP Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, and several other big banks were discussing a potential deal with First Republic Bank that could include a sizable capital infusion to shore up the beleaguered lender. Uh, there's new news now that these 11, that these banks, 11 to be exact, uh, pledged First Republic $30 billion in deposits. Um, I would think this would lower contagion risk. Uh, the S&P, Dow, NAS, all in green today. Also, the ECB hiked interest rates another 50 basis points today. So with so much that has happened this week, do you still think the Fed will go 25 basis points? I think that I don't think they know themselves for sure right now. Um, but given that the ECB went 50, the very popular line of reasoning that you hear on financial media that, you know, the Fed's going to be scared into into pausing loses a lot of credibility. I mean, the ECB went 50. So I think the Fed will probably go 25. Of course, uh, the way the news cycle's been going, uh, we could get New, new data any time now. I mean, I, I agree with you. Obviously, when you can identify a lifeline of thirty billion to Regions Bank, and we're they're talking about uh, in uh, Credit Suisse getting a lifeline from the government. Um, obviously, for the short term, things are feeling better. And mm -hmm. when Re Regions Bank opened the day down, and then ended up ten percent on the day. So, but this uh, is still a sort of a red alert situation. I, m I remember back in the GFC, the global financial crisis, that there were many episodes of relief and uh, rallies based upon relief. Uh, and this one's a little trickier. Uh, in the global financial crisis, I knew when those moments of relief came, I knew that they wouldn't last because th that was a problem with assets that weren't worth anything. And people were trying to pretend they were worth something. And all of the rescue attempts were... Uh, those attempts and they, they 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 just failed because you couldn't get put Humpty Dumpty back together again when you've got mortgages that aren't paying any money and they're all they aren't, aren't making any payments that are defaulting and the houses are way underwater that's it's just sort of an impossible situation. This time it's kind of weird how uh, absent I would say the regulators were. This is not a this one's not complicated. You don't have to. The, it took people a long time to understand what was going on with the repackaging of garbage mortgages, because just that's semi-complicated. But in this case, the Fed, you have the Fed's interest rate increases colliding with uh, regulators and the, the, the stupid gimmicky regulations that these banks, regional banks in particular, are forced to abide by. Um, it, it, strangest thing. Uh, Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, they bought treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. These are not hard to value. Treasuries, I mean, you can turn on the TV and you can see what's happening with, to, with treasury yields. And there's no assumptions. When, when, when you know the yield on a, on a say, a three-coupon treasury, 3% 3 coupon treasury, you know exactly what the price is. It's, it's a very simple thing. And the same thing for mortgage-backed securities. They're very easy to identify the prices. So what I don't understand is why nobody was paying attention to uh, these portfolios at uh, SVB when they're so easy to value. And obviously, with the, the Fed's interest rate hikes, we had a 13% drop in investment quality bonds in 2022. And from the peak to trough on long-term treasuries, which Silicon Valley owned, some of the drawdown was 50% in price from the peak to the trough. 
So I don't really understand why some regulator wouldn't be monitoring the held to maturity portfolio that they put these mortgages and treasuries into, uh, because the, the, when you do the accounting with this accounting gimmick, your held to maturity uh, securities have the benefit, I guess you want to call it that, of you don't have to mark them to market uh, unless uh, if you just hold them on your books. And so these bonds are going down 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. And it would just seem to be the easiest exercise for some regulator to just say, hey, uh, your looks like your uh, losses on your bond portfolio are greater than your equity. And that's that could be a problem. But nobody paid any attention to it. And I guess I guess the people that were so-called risk managing at Silicon Valley Bank, I, I guess they were just using hope as a method. That hopefully, when these hopefully we don't have a run on the bank of deposits, and hopefully these uh, bonds will, uh, you know, recover in value fairly soon. I mean, obviously by maturity they'll recover in value, but that could be a long time. So it's strange to me that somebody doesn't have just a spreadsheet every day. And Goldman Sachs went through this exercise. I was listening to a podcast they did uh, yesterday or the day before, and they went through. Uh, all banks, basically, that they had on their radar screen, and they did exactly that exercise. Are these, uh, you know, are these losses on the so-called held to maturity portfolio, once, once we actually market to market, which is easy to do, you don't have to account it that way formally if you're a bank, but any analyst can do it. Are these losses bigger than your equity? And per Goldman Sachs, uh, the only one that that was true for was this one bank, SVB. So that leads me to believe that there's not, it's not so obviously going to be an, uh, an ever evolving, you know, set of shoes coming out like Amelda Marcos's closet, like it was back in the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think the federal raise interest rates, 25 basis points. They've, they've got, they've got a problem uh, if they stop raising interest rates. I mean, one of the things is that by uh, bailing out the depositors of SVB, that's essentially a quantitative easing program. So th that, that is a short term. I know people are talking about this event as being deflationary, and in some ways it is. But in terms of money printing and what caused inflation to go from 1.7 when Joe Biden took office to 9.1 last June, I mean, that was all of the, the quantitative easing and the money giveaways. And so this reverses uh, the, the, uh, making these depositors whole. Uh, even above the, the FDIC limit, it's basically uh, about the same as a month or two of, of reversing the quantitative tightening. So the, the Fed should probably raise interest rates 25 basis points to stay on track. But, uh, you know, if you get, we get one more, if we get one more uh, bank failure, then I'd, I think they'll stay on hold. But otherwise, I think they'll raise the 25. Okay. Now, um, you had an interesting tweet this week. You wrote, Ben Bernanke, March 2007, subprime is contained. Right. What were you suggesting here? I mean, I'm just suggesting you know, that when, when you, and it happened today. All I'm saying, I'm not really saying this, this has to go that way. What I'm saying is that's what you're going to hear from public officials. It's all going to be, you know, rainbows and lollipops, and just as it was during the global financial crisis. Uh, but there can be more layers of this sort of a thing. And uh, so that's what, I, that's what I meant by uh, that. I, I was predicting that we'll hear, you know, gentle statements from people who really should have been doing real work, like, like uh, the spreadsheet that I've already referenced. Somebody should be doing this. I mean, you, 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 it would cost almost nothing uh, to do it. So that's what I meant by that tweet. So uh, is Credit Suisse a harbinger for other large banks? Uh, just pivoting here. Is, no. Is, you know, Credit Suisse. I don't think so. Credit Suisse has been a basket case. They never really recovered from the global financial crisis. And they, yeah, and I think you and I have talked about this for a very long time. Right. Um, I, I'd be more concerned mm -hmm. if Deutsche Bank was having the same price action as Credit Suisse. Uh, Credit Suisse has been on and off our approved list for for many years. You know, when when there's a calm seas, 
you know, maybe and their stock does better. Maybe we would transact with them. But we've, they've been often they've, they've, they've just been uniquely bad. Uh, it's, it's surprising that they haven't been merged in with UBS yet. Any other uh, any other big red flags we need to look at? I mean, I know again, you and I have talked about Credit Suisse for a very long time. Well, um, yeah, I, but I think the, the the red flag is we don't have to say we're going to have a collapse of the financial system, but one thing that must happen is definitely recessionary, and that is regional banks are are going to and and, and banks broadly probably are going to have to raise uh, the rates they pay on deposits. Uh, this has been the, the most amazing situation for banks. We've had the Fed raise rates 450 basis points, and they've raised their deposit rates almost nothing. So this has been just a, just a windfall for the banking system, and yet the banking sy- uh, stocks haven't even done well. So and I, 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 think, you know, I think that's because the curve's inverted, frankly, uh, why the banks aren't doing well. But, uh, and they also have a lot of legacy deposits that are at very low interest rates. And that's basically the problem that SBB got into. They got a flood of deposits back in 2021 when interest rates were at zero. And so they, they had to buy something that had risk, whether it was credit risk, which they did not do, or it was treasuries. Well, to get yield on treasuries when Jay Powell was holding the rate at zero forever, seemingly, you've got to go out and buy the one year, 1% yielding tenure or the 2% yielding long bond. And of course, those rates went up quite a bit higher from there. And so, boom, you have, they're, they're, you're a victim of your own success. Uh, you, you got tons of deposit money in, but you, you, you couldn't invest it without taking interest rate risk. And so you just sort of did that. Some people criticize SVB for not hedging. That's just, that's just nonsensical. That's just an ignorant statement. Uh, if they hedged, there's two problems with hedging. The first is if you hedge duration risk down to zero, you get the T-bill rate. So that completely short circuits the whole, the whole purpose. So you can't hedge and, and still get yield uh, in, in the treasury bond market. And the other thing is, uh, while your bonds would be held to maturity, your hedges would have to be marked to market. And so you would have real potential losses uh, from, from your hedges that you would have to realize that you could go insolvent that way. So uh, this, is, this is probably a really good uh, development for uh, large banks, the so-called SIBs, the two the ones that are thought to be systemically important, because they're going to need a lot more deposits. And when they get deposits, they're still paying 50 basis points, and they might not, or, or less. And they, they don't even, you know, they don't have to raise their deposit rates because they're the beneficiary of all these flows coming in and they don't have to lend it. They can just buy the, they can just buy the one year bill. I mean, if your deposit rate, you're paying 50 basis points, you can get four and three quarters or something on, in the T-bill market. That's just a money machine. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're completely matched. You, you don't have to go long. So that's probably good for the big money center banks, but for the regional banks, the only way people are going to keep their money in them is if they start paying more on deposits because they clearly have risk. And then there's this, this, the next question is, now that we've said we're going to uh, pay all the depositors, even those with millions of dollars in their checking account at, at SVB and Signature Bank, what about all the other regional banks? Who's going to want to go there? Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I think that obviously when this type of thing happens, lending standards get tightened. People become more cautious. And in this is, instance, it's going to be really bad for the regional banks. So I think it's appropriate that their stocks have dropped. Um, I, I suppose there could be more runs on deposits, and that, that could end up causing problems. Uh, but these people would need to lose more of their uh, d- depositor, depositor base, I think, to have an, another you know, inning in this baseball game. Uh, I, I, would say that, I would say the chances of another bank having a problem sometime in the next month is certainly non-trivial. So it's, it's one of these things where uh, it's not a, a certainty, like it was in the global financial crisis, that everything was going to go to zero. This is, this is more of a, of a rate policy. I mean, what they should really do, rate policy colliding with stupid accounting rules, what they should do is 
is, is uh, uh, basically correct the ridiculous accounting and uh, get, get to something that's not 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 so to myth. I mean, this hell of maturity thing is it's just a myth. It's the, there are real prices and they're readily available. So I think that should be gotten rid of. But uh, so I know Jeffrey, you had an investor webcast, I, I believe, a week ago. I mean, it just feels like very a lifetime. Um, yeah, and the, the amazing thing was I, I called it Survivor, and I thought that yeah, that was that was strangely prescient. Uh, <laughs> it, it, that really wasn't the total purpose. I mean, it wasn't about the banking system. It was it was about how I'm one of the last survivors left from the the old guard of the bond. Uh, investor universe. You know, so many people that were around in the 80s are gone now. Uh, when I started about 40 years ago, you know, I was the youngest guy around. Uh, now I'm one of the older guys around. And the, there's, there's a very few of, of that generation left. Uh, so I called it that for that reason. But also I called it with a double entendre that now not double entendre, double meaning that uh, what, in, in spite of what people think, the, it's, the goal is survival. Uh, the goal last year was survival, and now th this year it's even more so, because now we have, you know, sh cracks in the financial system. So you gotta, you gotta look real carefully at, at what you're doing. So, so what are you doing in this market? Um, what are you buying? What are you avoiding? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we've we've been anticipating an inverted yield curve and the consequences of recession because of the inverted yield curve and everything else that higher interest rates bring around for 18 months now, we, have, we have, haven't really changed our strategy in, in 18 months. We've, we're deliberately, but I don't mean that we've done nothing for 18 months. What I mean is we, we started on a strategy of lengthening maturities, lengthening duration of portfolios. That we started about a year ago and uh, also reducing credit, moving up in credit. So reducing everything that has credit risk, particularly when you go below investment grade, or certainly deeply below investment grade, increasing treasuries and extending duration. And we've, for the first time uh, since about that one year to 18 month ago, a strategy decision, for the first time ever, we considered shortening duration yesterday. Uh, the problem uh, but, uh, in the treasury market, the problem with selling treasuries is the market is uh, for the past week has been wildly illiquid. Um, it was fairly calm today. I was down. Bonds were down a lot today in the treasury market. But uh, but it, it, it was kind of calm. It was just a step function down, I think, in reaction to some of this uh, lack of flight to quality uh, bid increase. Uh, uh, from this, these lifelines that have, that have showed up. So for the first time, we thought about selling bonds, but the liquidity is so bad that the bid-ask spread was about 10 basis points. If you're going to sell a 30-year treasury, the bid-ask spread was about a point and a half, maybe two points in the, on the, in the bad moments. I mean, the, one of the strangest bond days ever was uh, Tuesday of this week, where if you if you took your eyes off of the of the treasury market screen for one minute, and I mean that literally, that's not an exaggeration. For one minute, when you looked back at the screen, the price could be a point different on on ten years, thirty years. It, it, there was just insanely illiquid in the treasury market. So I'm thinking that you know the flight to quality rallies are very very severe, and they uh, go into a crescendo, which happened. Uh, I would say yesterday. And I don't know. I, I think we're going to be chopping around uh, for a while here. But I'm not, I'm not interested in uh, buying credit at all at these levels, particularly not the, the junk bonds uh, that just seem crazily expensive to me versus the rest of the credit market. And my least favorite investment, so we own none of this, are triple C rated floating rate bank loans, which were my favorite, one of my favorite investments last year, actually. Not really the triple C's, but that sector. But now the triple C's, uh, they're, right now they've fallen so much in price because of default fears, and those fears are warranted. The yield to maturity on an index of triple C floating rate bank loans 
the yield to maturity with if there's no defaults, which is a terrible assumption, but that's how yields are quoted, is 20% on, on triple C bonds. Well, obviously, mm -hmm. that is implying defaults. And of course, since these are floating rate, these companies are under a lot of stress because they're getting an interest rate bill every quarter that's been rising at an alarming rate because it tracks the Fed funds rate, of course. So you have the worst possible situation. You have stress on the companies and uh, you know, low quality balance sheets to begin with. But also there are very close uh, correlation between lending standards in the financial industry, which have been tightening for a year now and not, not by a small amount. There's a high correlation between that tightening of financial conditions with future defaults on bonds generally, but high yield bonds and bank loans in particular. And it leads by about oh, eight to 12 months. And the tightening just into year end was sufficient that it put a, a prediction, correlated to a prediction that you would have an 8% annualized default rate in the high yield bond market by the end of 2023. Obviously the events of the past couple of weeks uh, have tightened financial conditions much more. And at the, at the, you know, regional banks supply credit to a lot of small businesses, a, a large fraction of small business loans go through regional banks and that credit's just going to dry up or get much more expensive. And so that's clearly a financial condition tightening. And uh, so I think that we're at the point that almost seems like, I used to say uh, a month or two ago that the recession would probably come in the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of 2024. And I just think that's too far out in the future at this point with all that's going on. I, I think I think we're, recession's probably within, I don't know, four months at the most at, at this point. Almost every indicator that's reliable about recession is, is, has flipped into high probability position. The only one that hasn't is the unemployment rate, which is uh, at 3.6. And when it crosses its 12 month moving average, it's a very reliable indicator that you're right at the doorstep of recession. And the 12 month moving average uh, is around 3.6, 3.7 today. So we're right on the edge of crossing over. So all we need is unemployment to go up a little bit and uh, there'll be flashing recession. The other thing that people look at a lot, and it's wise to do so, but most people don't have the length of experience that I do, to look at the yield curve. And when the yield curve inverts, it puts you on recession watch. And you always get Wall Street analysts putting out white papers on why this time it doesn't matter. And, uh, but we got very- yeah, we heard some of that earlier this year. Yeah, but when you get this inverted, I think those voices get silenced. I mean, the two the the, the ten year yield was one hundred and seven basis points below the two year yield a few days ago, and that's interesting and very uh, concerning if you're looking for economic growth. But the thing that most people don't understand is that ratio of ten year how much how much it is below the two year. When it gets very wide, like it absolutely got last week, it's not yet a recession. It's when it stops inverting, when it de-inverts. So in other words, when short rates start falling, and that's the market sniffing out that conditions are bad and the Fed's going to have to start cutting rates fairly soon. And that's been happening. Uh, it's been happening uh, for the past week. So uh, I think it's quite, uh, quite likely that we're going to have some economic problems uh, in the next uh, couple of months, maybe four months at the most. And that could further, uh, further fuel problems at some of these regional banks, because if economic activity slows down, now the, the, Fed, the Fed might bail, bail them out by starting to cut rates a little bit. And of course, if treasury rates started to fall in the context of a recession, well, that kind of that, that would have solved SVB's problems because their collateral would have gone up in value. And so mm -hmm. that, could, that could relax things. But it's going to be very uneven. Once you go through the meat grinder like this, you know, it's, this, is what, this is what the Fed, this is, what, this is why the Fed tightens interest rates to fight inflation. 
they're, they're tying it and they're, they're intentionally, and Jay Powell even alluded to it, although somewhat vaguely, they, they're trying to cause pain. They, they want unemployment to go up because that. Well, he said so himself, too. There's going to be pain involved. Right. He said it repeatedly last uh, summer into the fall, but he didn't say that February 1st. In fact, he looks he looks kind of foolish now. Um, and this is why this is one of the reasons why I'm not sure they can keep rates unchanged, because why didn't he know about this like February 1st? Why didn't he know about, uh, you know, d- does he not understand how the accounting rules work and how he's raising interest rates and how bonds had the worst year ever? I mean, you'd think that would be a fairly easy thing for the chairman of the Federal Reserve to be on top of. But he wasn't on top of that. Instead, February 1st, he used the word disinflation 12 times in a threat. Mm-hmm. So he was really acting like we got nothing to worry about here. But it's, you know, the lags of monetary policy are long and variable. And it ends up, it ends up taking some sector or some companies, uh, it's taking them down. You know, it's obviously it's already taken down the mortgage industry, the, the construction industries going to be in real problems I'm, I'm a positive you're going to start seeing unemployment from that area so yeah the uh it's it's kind of odd that they missed that so jeffrey we've got a lot of traders on spaces right now yeah. how would you trade the equity markets i mean it just sounds like you know today i would sell it feels like a bear market rally i would sell, ra- um, yeah, I would sell rallies yeah. sell all rallies yeah i've been short i've been short for a long time since you know, no, basically the top, very pretty near the top. I was probably, I was early, I'm sure, but I've been short for a long time. And I, I just think that the equity market is ch- highly challenged by these bond yields at these levels. Now, if, if the policy changes and we start to see more convincing relaxation of bond yields, maybe I'll change that opinion. But, uh, you know, the, the, there's some pretty interesting facts that developed thanks to these rate hikes, like the yield on the 60-40 portfolio, stocks, bonds, 60-40, the yield uh, was, the 60-40 yield was below the yield on the one-year T-bill. You know, these are some pretty, pretty unheard of relationships. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that that keeps the the stock market just on its heels. Uh, The fact that rates have relaxed a little bit in response to this crisis is, is incrementally helpful but the competition from bo- from treasury bond yields for equities is still very severe. Do you about the historical backdrop of the inversion of the yield curve? Like ahead of the uh, what do you mean by is- backdrop? Just uh, what, what happens is that the yield curve goes negative, meaning short rates are higher than say ten years or thirty years. Uh, it goes higher because of Fed tightening, uh, usually in response to a hot economy or inflation, which is the case this time. And it just and that means that investors are starting to forecast that really the Fed's going to start cutting rates because that's why people would buy, uh, you know, would be buying 10-year treasuries at lower yields than short rates. They think short rates are coming down. And so that's a signal that the collective wisdom of, of, of the treasury buyers thinks that rates are coming down. And what ends up happening is that the, the, the Fed ends up taking the Fed funds rate up to where the two-year treasury rate is below the Fed funds rate. And that has happened. And it, th- this pattern happens every single time that the yield curve does this behavior, goes inverted, then de-inverts with all the sort of, and it takes time. It takes several months for it to work, work its way through. Every single time, without exception, there's a recession. Also, just to add in another fun fact, every time the unemployment rate goes up by 0.5% uh, or more, but all you need is 0.5%, there's always a recession. The entire data series, going back to whenever it started, uh, there has never been a 50 basis point or higher increase in the unemployment rate without a recession. And Jay Powell himself, in his December dot plot, we're going to get a new one next week, be interesting to see what it says, he's predicting a recession because he predicted the unemployment rate was going to go up by 140 basis points from where what its, what its low point was a couple months ago. So even Jay Powell's predicting recession. That's what the pain is all about. You have to you have to slow down the economy. And that means getting people, you know, job contraction. 
and that's uh, are we in for a mild recession or a severe recession doesn't matter it's that, that's the most common question i get asked and i always answer it the same way it doesn't matter and i'll tell you why if it's raining outside and it's raining at a half an inch an hour you need an umbrella if it's raining outside at two inches an hour you still need an umbrella in each case you need an umbrella so you have to prepare for the rain, regardless of whether it's shallow or severe, you're going to have problems in credit. You're going to have, uh, you know, a, a flight to quality aspect, and that's why we've been doing this for 18 months, going up in quality. We have we have a longer duration now than we've had in the entire 14 year existence of Double Line, from from the one of the shortest durations, and we've been there uh, basically from from we've been adding to it when when the 10 year Treasury yield goes above 4%. And uh, we've, been, we've been really going down in credit systematically. And those, those dollars have been going in, into treasuries. Uh, so that's, that's how we're seeing things. So Jim, I can I ask uh, one reader, more question? Can you hear Nick now? Nope. Um, wow. Can you ask uh, Jeffrey to comment on the uh, new BTFP uh, program the Fed announced? and explain, uh, give his explanation of how that's inflationary because JP Morgan today described that as sort of a stealth QE program. Okay, I'm gonna ask this one question first. Um, so there's a question from the audience. Um, if you believe the shorter duration treasury yields are a better approximation for where the Fed is likely to go in terms of monetary policy at this stage of the tightening cycle, so the two years served its purpose, but he's wondering if shorter treasury yields should be the new tell. Um, they're all they're all pretty much the same uh, right now. There's not a big difference between the two year treasury and say a six month bill. Uh, there's not there's not how many people have failed to figure this out, and they push back when I make this statement. The Federal Reserve just follows the two year. If you want to see something unbelievably convincing, just plot out on 40, 40 or 50 years of the Fed funds rate and the two-year treasury. And it is blatantly obvious that the Fed, that the two-year treasury leads the Fed funds rate, both on liftoff and both on yields peaking. So I don't understand why people say that the Fed, uh, the Fed pegs the two-year, the Fed, the Fed, uh, influences or determines where the two-year yield is. It's the other way around. It's the two-year treasury that tells the Fed what they're going to do. So the only way, the only thing that would make it somewhat uh, uh, rational to argue the other way, but it's a very short-term argument, would be if the Fed doesn't raise rates next week. It doesn't, if Fed does raise rates, I mean, next week, they won't really be following the two-year because the two-year yield dropped 120 basis points in four trading sessions, you know, and it got, and it's now far below today's, it's below today's Fed funds rate, let alone one notched up another 25 basis points. But my suspicion is that they're not going to raise rates again, even if they do the 25. And if they don't do the 25, uh, I don't know. I think probably they probably won't raise rates again. Them, so I, some, some have suggested, Liz Young, who's one of my favorites, um, she suggested they pause next week and then re-hike. They, they would only re-hike if the two-year treasury yield went up. If they, if they don't hike uh, next week, they, it, the two-year treasury yield will have to go up to about four and a half for them to even contemplate tightening. So that, that might be a tall order. Uh, although the flight to quality has gotten, you know, 120 basis points in four days. That hasn't happened since 1987 during a stock market crash. So uh, there certainly could be a retracement on the, on the two year. So we'll see. Maybe the two year will be at 440. I don't know. It's moving around so much. Maybe it'll be at 440. Yeah, exactly. On, on I mean, these are violent moves. Yeah. So yeah, th then, then, I think, then I think the Fed could, hu could, could hike. Uh, and it would still be in the context of the two-year at that point. Okay, I have another question from the audience. Regarding the BTFP program the Fed announced, 
Can you explain how this is inflationary? JP Morgan described it as stealth QE that could inject up to $2 trillion in liquidity. Now, what program are you talking about? I don't know that acronym. Is that, is that the depositor thing or what? That's the one that was announced uh, when they uh, insured the uh, depositors of Silicon Valley Bank, the BTFB Bank Term Funding Program, just this weekend. Bank Term Funding Program. That was on Sunday oh, afternoon that's the when the Fed and Treasury okay. rolled the, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I don't really follow acronyms. That's, that's, that's the, where, where they're, uh, well, look, they're, they're, they're taking collateral of, say, treasuries. They're taking that collateral and they, they, have, they have a par value, let's say, of a billion dollars. But the mark to market is not at par anymore because interest rates are up so much. So they're going to lend out a billion dollars but the collateral that they're getting is only worth, you know, $800, $800 million. So they've created $200 million of liquidity. Because these, the, 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 $200, the $200 million of liquidity, that's the inflationary aspect. That's why it's QE. The, 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 it's the same type of, it's, it's basically a, a sort of in real time, it's money printing. So, Jeffrey, um, what worries you the most right now? I mean, you talked about Powell. Um, I, 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 I think uh, uh, expanding wars worries me the most. Say not, that not, again? It, wars, expanding mm. wars. The United States mm -hmm. is broke. The Fed is broke. The Fed's, Fed, the Fed's balance sheet, has an, the Fed has a net worth of negative $1.1 trillion. So there's nothing they can do to fight any sort of problems that, so what, what, except for printing money. They've, they've got nothing left. They're, they're losing money every single month because the, the, the uh, interest being paid on the assets that they own from all the quantitative uh, easing uh, yield less than the Fed funds rate. So they have, they have negative carry going on. And so the, 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 tr the, the Fed used to send money to the Treasury Department because they had a profit. Now they, the, the Treasury has to send money to the Fed. And so that makes the deficit worse. See, we're, we're at this point in time where we're, 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 we don't have any road left to kick the can down on our gross uh, mismanagement of our finances and our monetary policy because the Social Security Administration's trustees admit that by their calculation, which assumes no recession under the current formula, the Social Security will run out of money in nine years. And by uh, 11 years from now, they'll have to cut benefits by 20% across the board in Social Security. So that's with no recession. Obviously, we're, we're, we're going to have a recession in the next nine years. We're probably going to have one in the next nine months. So the Social Security system is going to run out of money much sooner than nine years. It's probably going to be more like five years. So we have all this problem. We don't have any money, and we're giving money to Ukraine to fight a proxy war. Um, probably, uh, all these things are sort of interrelated. It seems like money keeps flowing, and it's debt-based money, to donors of politicians. So if you're a defense company and you make weapons that are being blown up in Ukraine, this is a great situation for you. You're getting, you know, contracts worth tens of billions of dollars, but those weapons get blown up by design and we just continue to up the ante. Um, but we don't have any money. You know, we, we, we're running a deficit that's 6% of GDP, probably about to go to 10% of GDP. We have to solve these problems. We have to, we, we, some of the politicians, I think Mike Pence did a good job with this about a month ago. They're trying to say, you know what, we actually have to get serious on this. But, you know, that's the third rail of politics, as everybody knows, Nobody wants to touch it, but we have to. What, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. It, all these things are interconnected. SVB, why did they buy long treasuries? Because they had to, right? And we had an accounting gimmick that allowed that to happen. Well, we've got accounting gimmicks, gimmicks in the federal government, too. And why are we borrowing so much money because we have to you know you can't you we can't raise taxes we can't cut spending but we have to reform some of these unfunded liabilities because otherwise we're going to have a uh, 
well, we're, we're going to have a societal di- disintegration. So I know you have to go. Um, for those who are joining us, we went through a lot in the last 45 minutes, but I did want you to talk a little bit about gold. Yeah. Um, we have some gold bugs in the yeah, audience. Yeah, I, 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 I turned favorable on gold at 1800 uh, and it hung around there for a long time. It actually went to, to 2000 for, for a moment. But then went back down to 1800, uh, and clearly, uh, clearly, gold is is a, a inflation hedge, and I I do fear that I do fear that when the recession comes, that there's going to be a quick cut in interest rates, and there's going to be quantitative easing. They're going, to, they're going to increase their balance sheet again. That's the only tool that they have. That's the only tool that they've used for 20 years, basically, is, is you, you use ever more deficit spending. And it's going to be so much that the dollar is going to collapse uh, under the weight of the, de- of the deficit. And that means that we could run into, uh, after the recession, we might fight the recession with a hyperinflationary type of policy, quantitative easing, low interest rates, it'll just be you know forget the inflation number, you know it doesn't matter. Uh, that we'll, they'll they'll decide that five or six percent is just fine. Of course, by doing these actions, it would go to more like fifteen percent, but gold would do well under that scenario. I wouldn't. This is not a you know buy it today thing because it's rallied on flight to safety a fair amount now. But gold at around these levels. Uh, I, I think is a is a good long term hold, and uh, and gold and, and other things that have true value. I'm not talking about all these bogus uh, cryptocurrencies and all this other stuff that seem to just vanish. Uh, I'm talking about things that have proven value: land, gold, you know, collectibles, stuff like that. I'm, I'm I've been favorable really since about 2011 on all of these things. And you said that you're short um, stocks. Uh, wh- again, um, the S and P. What level? What level are you looking? Oh, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's going to 3,200. Uh, I, I think that's quite likely. Uh, but it could. I, I think if if, if this it's sort of a coin flip. If this crisis ter- is truly a crisis which I'm still not sure it, it really is, although the policies in the recession might cause the crisis. So I, I think stocks could go to 3,200. They could, but they could, they, if, it was, if, it was, if it's a two inches an hour type of a rainstorm, then the, the stock market will drop quite, quite far below 3,200. Jeffrey, it's always great to speak with you. Thank you so much for your time. Um, we'll... We'll keep an eye on your tweets and your webcasts. Thank you so much. Any last words? Uh, the goal for 2023 is survival. So that means losing as little money as possible and uh, putting together portfolios that have risk offsets, which you can do now. But a year and a half ago, there was no way to risk offset stock risk or junk bond risk because treasuries had no chance of rallying. The yields were, too, were, were on the ground already. So if the stock market sold off, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get a profit. Or if junk bonds started defaulting, you wouldn't get a profit on your treasuries because there's nowhere, nowhere for them to go. But now, when you have 4 4.5% four yields, not as good as when they were a little bit higher, but it's n- no problem at all for the 30-year treasury bond to go up, 20, to go up 40%. It would need it would need a big drop in interest rates of about 200 basis points, but it would go up 40 percent with mathematical certitude. So that's that's why I think we can we don't. Last year it was lose as little money as possible. This year it's try to lose no money. Uh, and I think on that note, thank you. Okay, th- thank you again, Jeffrey. Right, thank you very much. Bye now. Okay, bye guys. Thanks everyone.